Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 500 of them, of them now. And if this is new to you and you'd like to check out the archives, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu where you'll see them all organized in several different ways. This program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. <clears throat> so if you appreciate it and would like to contribute, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. <clears throat> My guest today is Shamji Bhatnagar. Welcome, Shamji. Thank you. Um, Sri Shamji was born in 1936, which would make you about 83 now, right? Actually, 84. 84. Year. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 49, so I just did the math. And <laughs> but I'm, I'm still uh, 79. No, what am I? 69. And uh, anyway, you were raised in India. At age 12, you met your spiritual teacher in the Himalayas and spent several years under his guidance. Uh, I'll read this short bio, but then I have like three questions just from the bio. Your guru initiated you into the Shaivite tradition of Tantra, imparting a rare oral tradition of sacred sounds, Nada Yoga, and breath, Svara Yoga, and spiritual wisdom. The grace of your guru and the spiritual practices he imparted are the basis for, Shri Sha- for your intuition and unique chanting of sounds and mantra. For millennia, this tradition was passed down from generation to generation through an oral tradition which preserved its purity. Okay. So my first question is, how did you end up meeting your guru at such a young age? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, on May 12th of 1948, we five boys uh, took a, a little train and went down about four or five kilometers to steal some lychees, lychee fruit. And then, of course, every half an hour or so, there was a train coming back. And I picked a couple extra leeches, and I couldn't run fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I missed the train. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then, of course, I waited for the next train to come. And I was sitting in the, uh, the forest of the leeches, and all of a sudden, I hear a, a voice. And I was just going in every direction to find the source of the voice. And I couldn't. And finally, I saw in a little hillock a man sitting there, old, old, old man. And he, I walked towards him, and he called me by, his, by my first name. So I thought, you know, my father is a doctor in town, so maybe he's one of his patients or something. No. Then he said to me, you will not believe me, but I was your teacher in your last life. And inside I laughed because I didn't believe in those things at that time. And then he said to me, I'm son of Dr. Sevaram. And I said, yes. You, who is the son of Dr. Ramchand? And he went seven generations. I noted them down quickly, the ones that I didn't remember. And when I came home, I asked my father, do you know these names? He knew three more. And the last two, he didn't. So he called his father to find out if he remembered any more. He remembered one more. So he took it for granted that this man really knows everything, I guess everything. And that was very impressive. And then I started to see him on more regular basis by going to this temple in Dehradun. Uh, it's called Tafkeshwar Maharaj Temple. And he would periodically come and give me some instruction that I was supposed to follow. And that's how it started. So I studied with him for about four years. And so what sort of things did you learn when you were studying with him? Uh, you see, I had a lung disease, uh, congenital, and uh, I was mostly in pain. There was another thing. He gave me a small little pill, a round black pill. I don't know what it was. 
And I took that and my pain subsided for maybe an hour or two. So that was another miracle because I had never experienced a couple of hours of my life without pain. And uh, he taught me how to breathe and how to chant mantras by breathing in with the nose. Everybody I ever heard chanting mantras or singing, everybody breathed with their mouth. And when I started to breathe with my nose and chant, it created some extraordinary effect that I never experienced before. And that was the basis of my, my spirituality, shall I say. So I presume that your lungs got better. My lungs progressively got better, yes. Yeah, because, I mean, you're, you've been singing all your life now, using your voice. Chanting, yeah. Chanting. I, I call it chanting because chanting is with breathing with the nose. Yeah. Singing is breathing with the mouth. Okay. So there is a difference between the two. So um, on the one hand, I, I read in your book that you had a vision of the chakras while meditating in the Himalayas. But then in your bio, it talks about how um, the tradition, the knowledge you, you gained from your guru was passed down generation through, gen, as if, you know, over the generation through an oral tradition. So um, I presume that what we're concluding here is that you learned a lot from your guru, traditional knowledge that has been passed down for generations. And, um, but then you cognized even more than that a um, little bit later on in your life. Well, theoretically, I learned everything from my teacher. But over the years, uh, I didn't know about the chakras from experience. And one day in Vishishtu Gufa, that's a cave where uh, Sri Rama's guru, Sri Vishishta, he had done his, his spiritual work. And I was sitting there meditating, and that's exactly when, in 1966, I had my, this vision of the uh, extraordinary it was just an extraordinary day. Hmm. So you're just sitting meditating and all of a sudden you had this profound all of vision. All the these lights started to just, the discs of light spinning. And I mean, I had no way to contact my guru to verify because I didn't even know where to look for him. <laughs> yeah. But you managed to, oh, I guess you yes. retroactively figured out what it was. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, I would I would suppose that you spent years even after that sort of studying and learning and filling in all the details, right? Well, what happened is that a year later in New York, I had the vision of the micro chakras. And that was in automatic writing. For five hours, I was just writing and writing. And then I fell asleep over the yellow pad on which I was writing. And when I got up, I didn't even know that I wrote that. There's a story of 147 micro chakras. How it came, why it came, I still don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's fill in some gaps here. So most of the people listening to this will have heard of chakras and have some idea of what they are, but it would be good to get a definition because maybe not everybody has that knowledge. And even if they do, I'm sure you could fill in some more you know, some more information for us. Yes. First of all, we have to understand our physical body in which we live. Once I asked a professor of anatomy that you tell us that body is made up of hundreds of trillions of cells. He says, yes. And I said, do these cells have a feeling? He said, no. I said, do these cells have any thoughts? He says, no. And I said, how come we think and we feel? He says, that's a philosophical question I am not trained to answer. Which gave me the idea that why in our tantric tradition, we believe that we have three bodies. Physical body is just one of the three bodies. I look at physical body as an envelope. Inside the envelope, there is a letter. 
that is our subtle body. And our right hemisphere of the brain is receiving the messages from our subtle body, which turn into the feelings. And then the message in that letter is coming from the causal body. It's called Karan Sharira in Sanskrit. Subtle body is called Sukshma Sharira, which literally means subtle body. So every thought that we have is coming to us from the causal body, and the recipient of that is the left hemisphere of the brain. So in the absence of knowing that we have these two other bodies, we accuse the brain for thinking and feeling. <laughs> brain is a recipient, not producer. Mm. You know, a thought, comes, a thought comes and the neurons fire. A feeling comes, and the neurons fire. There's a big debate about this these days in science. I think it was maybe Science Magazine that posted an article about the hundred, maybe, I don't know if it was a hundred, but the, the biggest problems in science, you know, that are, that are unsolved. Number yeah. two is how does the brain produce consciousness? And number one is what is the universe made of? And of course, people who are you know, not materialists are saying, well, the brain doesn't produce consciousness. The brain is like a radio. It receives consciousness, you know? Actually, there are two words in English language that need a little bit better understanding. One is awareness. And one is consciousness. Awareness fluctuates. For example, right now I am able to see you on the screen. But I can't see what is behind me. So I am not aware of what is behind me, but I am aware through my senses of what the reality I experience. Consciousness in the contrary, it always is, and it always was, and it always shall be. Consciousness is the one on the authority of which the universes come and go, breath comes in and goes, Consciousness doesn't go anywhere, even if, the, <laughs> even if the universe goes into the black hole. Consciousness does not. Right. So we could say that consciousness is the ultimate reality or the fundamental reality, um, ind the indestructible, the eternal, and all that. Exactly. Ever right. present. Omnipresent. Right. Um, and that awareness, as we're defining it, is sort of what we happen to be aware of at the time. And that, that obviously fluctuates. Exactly. Yeah. And would you say it's true that we are aware of things by virtue of consciousness, that consciousness, and yeah, consciousness is the light by which we experience or we are aware of things? Nothing can exist without consciousness. Right. Okay, good. Well, that's a good definition. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned three bodies, uh, gross, subtle, and causal. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting. I sometimes have discussions or debates with people about reincarnation, for instance, and they say, how could that be? You know, your body dies, you're, you're dead, you're done. And how could something possibly go into another body? And, and then you have to bring in the idea, well, we have a subtle body, and the subtle body is different than the gross body. When the gross body dies, the subtle body doesn't die, and then that eventually gets into another body. But somehow this is like perplexing to some people. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about the idea of three bodies, what they are, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, one definition of the subtle body I already explained to you, which is that every feeling you have, you have ever had, whether it is of love or even ego, physical tissue does not have any ego. <laughs> ego is a feeling. <laughs> it comes, it rises, and it subsides. You can use it, and you can surrender it. You can use it, you can surrender it. Subtle body, in fact, is affecting our nervous system from the back. That's what the argument I had with my publisher when I presented the cover of the book and I showed the chakras affecting us in the back. Yes, he said to me, every other book shows the chakras in the front. And I said, think why? Because it's more interesting. <laughs> Well, obviously, the spine is in the back. Exactly. 
So chakras are affecting our spine, the plexi, the nerve ganglions. They are the ones who receive the light from the chakras. So um, I'll just ask dumb questions here and, and give you an opportunity to explain in greater detail. So someone might ask, uh, what is the subtle body made of? We know our gross body is made of various chemicals and substances and all, but what is the subtle body made of? Subtle body is made up of, what is the truth made up of? What is love made up of? Good question. Love, Could we say there's such a thing as subtle matter that these things are, are made of? But according to Einstein, matter doesn't even exist. Well, yeah. Uh, because we are in the material body. Mm -hmm. We live in the material body. So we think materially. But scientifically speaking, matter does not exist. In fact, I had a quotation from uh, Einstein. Matter does not exist, he says. He says we have been wrong all along. All that exists is energy. But we can't perceive the energy. Therefore, the energy has to lower itself to become perceptible to our senses. That's when the yogis decided that why trouble the mother goddess, the energy, to come down from her status to be perceptible to us. We can raise our standards, our senses, so we can perceive the mother goddess. The reason I say mother goddess is because energy is translated as goddess in, in Indian literature. And that's why they worship the goddess. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, we, we won't go off on Einstein, Einstein too much right now, but, um, <laughs> okay, so we have, because he does, he did say E equals MC squared, and the M stands for matter in there. Um, <laughs> but that was in the beginning, that's why he said, we have been wrong all along. Oh, I see. So, so later on, he said it. Okay, good. Absolutely. Um, all right. So we have a rough idea of what chakras are. I mean, you have a good idea. The rest of us have a rough idea of the different energy centers in the body from the base of the spine to the top of the head. And um, everyone's heard talks about that, the heart chakra and the second chakra and everything. But um, probably you are the only person I've ever heard of who talks about micro chakras. Mm -hmm. So um, what are micro chakras? Micro chakras, I can give you only an analogy with the sun. Sun rays travel and they enter our body and everything else to nurture. If, for example, you are sitting in a basement of a building, outside there is sunlight, but you are not receiving the sunlight. Why? Because there are blocks everywhere that is blocking the rays of the sun. Similarly, the chakras are spinning. They are pure light spinning, and they are of different hues, by the way. Now, they are spinning and spinning, and the light can come to our back. But the light is traveling through the rays. Those rays are called micro chakras, meaning the light of the chakras has to enter our body from the back. However, if those micro chakras get blocked, and there are 147 of them, then you don't receive that particular U of light. Consequently, whatever that light is related to, which is what is called the micro chakra psychology, and you can read about them, at least 98 are mentioned in the book. And uh, I would have liked another uh, 49 to be mentioned, but the book was getting too big. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you're saying that light in the ordinary sense comes in through our eyes, but in a subtler sense, it comes in through our micro chakras in the back. Is that? They are the yes. Micro chakras are the carrier of the light. Chakras never get blocked. Sun never gets blocked. Even if the clouds come in front of it, sunlight is still passing through it. So are you just talking about sunlight that comes in through the micro chakras or, or a subtler, no, no, no. subtler form the, of light? The, the subtle chakras, their light travels through the micro chakras and they enter our body. 
Okay. Seventh chakra light will enter from the top of the head, and the first chakra light will enter from the coccyx. So, even in a dark place, like a yogi meditating in a cave where there's no sunlight, light could be coming in through his micro chakras. That uh, is correct. Because it's a subtler form of light that's exactly. not, not the same as the visible. No. Okay. Okay, good. Um, and so, I would presume that almost everybody has blocked micro chakras, probably in different proportions. Some of them are open, some of them are closed, and it's a unique signature for every person. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And how, what are the symptoms of them being blocked? Um, or, or what are the symptoms of particular ones being blocked? And, and just in, as part of, in addition to this question, each of the chakras has a number of micro chakras. And I also heard you say that each of the micro chakras has micro micro chakras, and it sort of goes all the way down. <laughs> yeah, I can't feel them, but intellectually, I can, I can understand that there are subtler and subtler micro chakras. Uh -huh. But practically, but we just go down one just, level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I can't feel them. Right. I can only feel the micro chakras. I can feel 49 micro chakras in the right side of your spine. I can feel 49 in the left channel. I do that whenever uh, uh, somebody comes for a two hour long consultation. That's you, what I do. You tune I make in. A chart. I, I make a chart of their micro chakras and I give them a copy of it so that they can look at it in the book and they can see why this micro chakra got blocked and how can we open it I give them instructions. I have been, I must have seen more than, I must have given consultations more than 50,000 times in my life. And I know people who have dramatically changed because their blocked micro chakras became open. So when you do the consultation, you go into a, a sort of a meditative state or some, some, some kind of state that enables you to sort of cognize on a subtle level what's going on with the microchakras? Yes, partly that and partly the client has to be relaxed. So we have, I have developed a, what is called inner tuning massage. It's a 15 minute uh, work on the head and uh, shoulders and neck and face, which prepares people to be so relaxed that in my own meditative state, I can feel uh, their micro chakras along the spine. Okay. And then I make a chart. So, you, so two things have to be there. You have to be in a meditative state and they have to be relaxed and then, <laughs> then there can be an attunement. Exactly. Okay, good. That's why I call it inner tuning. Ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I presume that, you know, all kinds of things I can think of that probably would block your micro chakras, like th certain things that happened in your upbringing or in your childhood, or maybe you took drugs at a certain point or alcohol or, or had, you know, traumatic experiences. You were a soldier in Afghanistan or something and you had a lot of stress. And is that correct? I mean, all sorts of life experiences, things we consume and, and experiences we have, all of these would create blocks. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the way to understand that is, uh, there are three, three channels that intersect all seven chakras. I, for convenience, I call them right channel, the central channel, and the left channel. Right channel energy descends from the birth to the first three years of a life of a girl. And these and are the either th the pingala and the shushumna, is that you're referring no, to? Or the is three that... channels, three channels are in the sushumna. They're in the shishun. Okay. Yes. Ira and Pingala are breathing channels. They they provide prana to the channels. You know, there are five different types of pranas. I will maybe later on I'll talk about uh, apana prana, which is the most important one to to purify for the rest of the three bodies to properly function and, and become closer to one another, each other. So these seven uh, micro chakras, they are in each chakra. And 49 of them, you know, mostly about 50% of them are blocked in the first three to three and a half years of life. 
So we have only 50% to work with. Left channel, you can open 100%. Even if some things are blocked in the right channel, you can still open it in the left channel. I can give you an example. If you were not a breastfed baby, your fifth micro chakra in the heart chakra will be blocked. Mm, mine must be blocked. My mother said that her doctor told her she shouldn't breastfeed me or anything. I remember my mother crying one time because she was deprived of that experience. I know several people like, your, like yourself. Unfortunately, uh, it is not true uh, that the breastfeeding can ever be bad for the baby. I shouldn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, doctors, sometimes they promote the formula. Uh, oh, yeah. In those days, they gave amphetamines to pregnant women. Uh, they called them pep pills, you know, so all kinds of yeah, crazy, crazy but, but things. You see, there's, there's something deeper that's happening. Maybe later in the, uh, in the conversation, we can talk about the deeper reasons why in the medical system they they believe that babies have no feelings. Right, right. That's why even today, right this very minute that I'm talking to you, some baby boy is being circumcised without, without anesthesia because babies are not supposed to have feelings. Which is, is, which is crazy. I mean, because obviously if you have ever interacted with a baby, <laughs> it's obvious he has feelings, you know. <laughs> if, you pin, if you pinch him, he'll cry. What, whatever adjective you use uh, will be insufficient. Right, right. C crazy is a kind way of putting it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's not get too sidetracked. But um, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let me just get down to the math again for a second. So each, you said each chakra has seven micro chakras, but that's seven sevens or 49. Uh, how did we end up with 147? 49 in the right channel, 49 in ah, the central channel. There we go. 49 in the left. Okay, good. Got it. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, proceed from here. Probably I, I've interrupted you several times in the middle of a thought that you might want to complete. Yes. So tell me what we were, what were we talking about? Well, we were talking about how they get blocked in the first place. Right. And, and we assume, I assumed, and you confirmed that everybody has some of them blocked, various combinations with different people, and that there are various life experiences that can block them. Maybe we should now talk about how you go about unblocking them. Unblocking takes place through inner tuning practices. And there are different practices that I, uh, I designed for people as I see their age, their work situation, what part of the planet they are living, uh, living in. So it becomes a very individual, individualized program. But it's uh, once a person has learned it or been instructed, there's, there's something they can practice on their own. They don't have to sit with you every time, right? No, they don't. For example, I go to Europe uh, three times a year. Every four months, I can see my students to see what progress they have made. Then I give them either a change in the mantra or a change in the meditation technique, or change in some yoga postures, uh, change in the sleeping posture. I mean, there are lots of things. Lots of things I, you can do. Exactly. Okay. A question just came in, which it might be good to ask at this point. It's relevant to what we're talking about. This is from KP in Mumbai. Uh, he says, do micro chakras relate to the petals on the chakras in the standard literature. You see those pictures of the chakras. What about the words on those petals that we find in the tantric literature? Yes. Yes, all of those are relevant. The petals of the, the chakras, they are the ones that start to vibrate when you pronounce those sounds properly. Now, this gentleman from Bombay, you said Mumbai, he came from, your question came from, uh, he will probably understand that there are four sounds inscribed, for example, on the pure lotus of the first chakra. Chakras are compared with the lotuses. Why? Because the lotus flower is the purest flower on the planet. Why is that pure in comparison to a rose or a lily? Because on a rose or a lily, if a muddy drop falls, of course it will roll off but you can see a track through which that rolled off. On a lotus flower, that track will not be there. 
It is called stainless. Oh, nice. Uh-huh. Yeah. They also say of lotuses that even though they have their roots in the mud, they have risen up above that. You know, they're, exactly. up, they're up above the water. That is what the yogis are supposed to do. They live absolutely pure life in spite of the fact that we live in dark ages. <laughs> this is, yeah. So the sounds that are there, they have to be pronounced properly. Now, for example, uh, the first sound on the first petal of the first chakra is called the sound of V. V. Now, if V is not pronounced by resting the two canines in the inside of the lip, it is not correct. You can also say V, which means that your canines are touching the outer part of the lip. Mantra will not work. It has to work in the inside because the inside is a sensitive pressure point. And when the canines, uh, when you make that sound, the canines will vibrate that point. That will keep that petal, shall I say, young. <laughs> you know? So there are, there are 49 sounds in all and three complex sounds, 52 sounds we have that the languages have borrowed the sounds from the chakras. Every language, some languages have 37 letters, some have 26, some have 18. In Sanskrit, you have 52. And the 330 millions of mantras are made up of those 52 sounds. Okay, let's fill in a couple more gaps here. Um, one is the assumption that, about it, you know, that everything we're saying is based upon that the nervous system on all of its levels is the sort of the vehicle or the instrument through which enlightenment is gained. Um, that's maybe just good to express. Um, and what you're talking about here is a way of tuning up the instrument so that it can support that experience, spirits of higher consciousness and so on. You would concur with that, I I assume? Yeah, you see the word, uh, first of all, if we understand that the light of the chakras, they have to keep on energizing the petals of the lotuses, which are called the chakras. When all 49 sounds are properly used, you have light, from the first chakra, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And all of them are basically related with the top of the head, the seventh chakra. For example, when your seventh micro chakra in the first chakra is completely open, you're getting all that yellow light sufficiently. Okay, first micro chakra of the seventh will then become open. Why? Because the seventh of the first is open. Then seventh of the second is open. Seventh of the third is open. So the seventh chakra depends totally on the contentment of the lower chakras. That's why I say that each chakra has a mind of its own. For example, the mind of your body is totally different than the mind of your gender. Men think differently than women because of their gender. So what you just said was that, um, as if I understand it, is that there's a connection or a correlation between the lower chakras and the seventh chakra, and as as the lower chakras or the or the lower micro chakras open, then correspondingly uh, the corresponding aspect of the seventh chakra will automatically open because of that correlation. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. It's just like a tone when the tone is in tune it will have an overtone that is in tune. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, sure. Like you can take a guitar string and and ring a certain string and it'll cause another string to to resonate with that, or two two tuning forks is another example. Okay, good. Um, Someone sent in a question relevant to what you just said. I might as well read it. This is um, Florence Boyce from New York City. She said that, um, I think that from Shamji's microchakra perspective, there is a discontentment in microchakras whose needs haven't been met. Are there ways to compensate for the unmet needs of microchakras? Repetition of doing the same thing over and over again is an attempt 
to open the seventh micro chakra. Such as, give us an example. Eating. Uh huh. Well, we do that every you, day. <laughs> <laughs> Many people do it three, four times a day. Yeah. Because the seventh micro chakra in the first is not open. And the reason it is not open is not because they are not eating enough. It's, they are not open because we are not eating properly. Uh, so you're not saying that people shouldn't eat. You're just saying that perhaps abnormal eating, such as overeating, would be caused by a discontentment in the micro chakra, right? Exactly. And okay. because they are discontent, they keep on eating more and more, hoping that they will become content. Right, right. The same is with the money. Money, video games, a million different things. People but become see, obsessed with them. The first three... The first three chakras, they are by nature restless and discontent. And the more of the stimulus you gather for them, the more addicted you get to the stimulus. For example, if you have earned a billion dollars in your life, you are not content. You want to now have two billion. And when you have two, you want to compare yourself with those who have four. So you keep on, keep on adding to that discontent feeling, hoping that someday you will be content. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Same is with sex. More sex you have, the more sex you want. Third chakra, more power you have, the more power you want. No president has ever renounced their place after eight years. It's just that they can't they have be elected to. after eight years. Right. After FDR, they had to. <laughs> so the first three chakras, they are discontent by nature. Intervention from the higher chakras has to take place for them to become content in the first three chakra minds. Interesting. Just a reminder of a Gita verse based on what you're saying. The, the objects of sense turn away from him who does not feed upon them, but the taste for them persists. On, on seeing the supreme, even this taste vanishes. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, it's kind of almost a cliche. People say, oh, yes, well, happiness has to come from within, and you don't get it from external objects and all. But you wouldn't think that was the case to see everyone in the world behaving as they behave. Um, so, and if you say that to somebody who's accustomed to deriving whatever shreds of happiness they get from external things, they won't understand what you're talking about, chances are. And so, you know, well, okay, so this will, I'll form this into a question. So what, what would you say to somebody who is addicted to this, that, and the other thing and try attempting to get fulfillment from outer experiences? Um, how do we turn them around and, and enable them to discover that fulfillment comes from within? Well, one question I sometimes I ask people to repeat to themselves. When you wake up in the morning and you say, yesterday, whatever you did, did it bring you any contentment? <laughs> well, they might say, yeah, I saw this movie. Yes. It was really great. Keep, I loved that movie. Keep repeating it. Yeah, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't want to see the same movie every day. You'd get tired of it. <laughs> or the same baseball game or the same whatever. You know, when you play a game and you lose, you have to change the strategy. If you think that just because you can win one game, that that's going to make you content, think again. You have seven different minds. Most of us don't even use all the seven minds. Most people, frankly speaking, live in the first three chakra minds, and they are discontent by nature. It's only the heart chakra mind that gives you a clue when you open up the unconditional love. That's what the heart chakra mind knows. Only problem with the heart chakra mind is it just doesn't know who to love unconditionally. And so it tends to love something that perhaps that might not be so uh, stable or consistent. Love worthy. Right, right. Huh. I'm reminded of a quote that's attributed to Einstein. I don't know if he said it, but it's that, um, you know, 
definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we, we've talked a little bit about inner tuning and uh, you have personal consultations with people and um, you give them programs to follow and then you go back periodically and uh, reconnect with them and, and maybe fine tune the programs that they're following. And you have some people who've been with you for years. So if I was one of those people, um, what would my daily routine be like? What would I be doing on a daily basis? Daily basis, they will make an attempt to go to bed as early as possible. Because the light at night is really not a very good thing for our pineal gland. All the artificial light. And artificial yeah. electric light. Mm -hmm. As much as we have gotten hundreds and hundreds of different uh, advantages from the light, lives are saved because we can drive the ambulance and take a person to the hospital under which under the light that they can be helped. So those are the thousands of benefits the light has given us, refrigeration and so on. But the problem is this. We have lost a biorhythm of the chakras, which is what I talk about. Our sixth chakra, it depends on the light and darkness rhythm. You see what happens at night when the sun goes down, the serotonin level starts to drop. And as it gets more and more dark, the melatonin level starts to rise. And that's why we can get a deep sleep. And then two hours before the sunrise, body feels rested. It tosses and turns to wake up. From the chakra point of view, what happens, energy reaches the seventh chakra level, uh, but two hours before the sunrise, it is in the seventh chakra. And suddenly it drops from the seventh to the first. Now this happens around the equator. Farther away you are, that time reduces. For example, New York area is much closer to the North Pole than the equator, India, for example, right? So in India, two hours before the sunrise, the energy will drop from the seventh to the first. Here, 90 minutes. Okay, so as the energy drops from the seventh to the first, the body shakes, it tosses and turns. Because we have not had enough sleep, we toss and turn and go back to sleep. So we miss the first chakra mind's rhythm. The first chakra rhythm is what? When you get up, your apana will stimulate, parastasis will start, and you will go and have a bowel movement. So my students, they are taught how to regulate their first chakra rhythm by having two bowel movements a day, one before the sunrise and one around the sunset. Once you have maintained that rhythm, all of a sudden you are much more in tune with your body and the purity of the body because the waste material doesn't really want to stay in your body. It wants to go out. But because of our lifestyle, because of the access to the electricity, I, I have raised three, four children. They will not listen. They will work at night. They will say, I want to do my homework at 11 o'clock at night. As if five o'clock in the morning is not very quiet. It's the mindset because everybody is doing it and therefore it becomes normal. No. Majority of the people sometimes do stupid things, does not make them normal. So. The pineal gland is the only light sensitive gland. And when you don't listen to its call, you force it to produce serotonin at night, melatonin during the day, well, it will catch up in time. You are going to have a brain related problems as you grow up. And you know, a sensible psychiatrist or doctors, when somebody has a problem with insomnia, first thing they will recommend them is to take some melatonin before you go to sleep. Why not take the melatonin from nature? 
Oh, I realized my mic was muted. Yeah, they they also say don't sit at your computer at night and stuff like that. You know, you just uh, gotta gotta settle down, shut down. Exactly. Get ready. So, what happens to people who live in, let's say, northern Alaska, where for half of the year it's light almost all the time, and for the other half of the year it's dark almost all the time? Well, the body tries to get adjusted, and the suicide rate or the depression rate is far higher in those climates and those altitudes. You will notice that. Uh, I, I remember I was very, very uh, impressed by Ingemar Bergman, a Swedish movie director. I, I thought he was one of the greatest uh, movie makers in the world. Yeah. And his subject most of the time was depression, that how people, how life is so depressing. You know, mankind did not evolve on the North Pole. It evolved around the equator. Now we, now we say it was Africa, but when the life evolved, which continent was, what, what was the shape of the continent? Who knows? That was millions of years ago, you see? Yeah, eventually so, people migrated to those places. <laughs> no, they, they in search for food. Everybody left, everybody left, not everybody. People who could not find food, they went southward or they went northward. So now we are stuck under the snow covered peaks, but that's not normal. That's why when you go for vacation, you don't go to North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> Some people do, they take these cruises to Alaska, but, yeah, not, but not in the winter time. <laughs> yeah, one in a thousand. Right. Yeah, I'm talking about the rest of the nine, 999 people. Yeah, all but right, so. Go to a tropical type of a climate. So one thing you said is that, okay, if I was your student, I would be uh, learning to get on a good routine, early to bed, early to rise. Exactly. What, what's another thing? Another thing is that uh, you work with the lights every day. For example, today is uh, Tuesday. Uh, yeah, right? it is. Mm -hmm. It's the day of Mars. The day of Mars. Every day is after the name of a planet. Did you notice that? I, well, I, my wife knows about that stuff, so I know, oh, I know maybe, it for, for that reason, maybe, I know it. Yeah, maybe, maybe her wisdom will be even more rewarded when she understands the reason I'm giving you. Okay. Yesterday was the day of the moon. That's why we called it Monday. Today is the day of Mars. So my students, they will be eating something that is orange, red. You know, there are so many colors of foods and vegetables and fruits. So why not make a choice of the color of the day? And how does that help? That will lay the layer of the red, the red planet. Okay, so you got red for Tuesday. You can wear something red or orange to remind you that today is Tuesday. Well, not all, not all planets have colors distinctively, like Venus, um, uh, no, no, Mercury, a, Jupiter. Uh, there is a predominant color. Mars has a predominant color, which is red, orangey red. Mercury is green. Jupiter is yellow. Venus is white. Saturn is black and blue. Sunday is gold. <laughs> So, so there's an advantage to eating all these foods on the different days. If you, if you, if you see what you do is, what is the purpose of life? From my standpoint and from tantric standpoint, purpose of life is to create circumstances in which you can become enlightened. Yes. Yeah. Which means to experience your own light. Every color of the spectrum is contributing to that light. So if in a seven day scale, you have absorbed the whole spectrum, not only by wearing it, eating it, 90% of the color you will take in with your eyes, 7% color you take in with what you eat, 3% from what you wear, you see? So 100% effect you will get if you concentrate and see that color you know, if you know today is Tuesday, you will watch every red card, every red sign, everybody who's wearing a red tie. Hmm. 
<laughs> you know. So I have the wrong color shirt on today. Well, maybe tomorrow you will probably be wearing green. Okay, I'll, to, is tomorrow a green day? That's right. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do if that. You go to my website and you download a Prana calendar. You'd have to wear a blue shirt every Saturday. I'll do that. I'll, I'll download it. What the heck? You see, my in my family, my sister in law, she's a gynecologist. Uh -huh. She says, of all your teachings, I like the one of the color. And my brother says, that's the one I hate because she has to go out and buy more clothes. Of that color. <laughs> that's funny. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so we have two things so far. We have early bed, early to rise, and uh, you know, bowel movement early uh, and twice a day. And we have this thing about the color correlations of each day. Exactly. What else? Uh, mantra. Okay. Chant. You see, the, let's understand the word mantra. What does that mean? It's made up of two words. Mantra iti trutyate. That's the equation. Mana means mind. By the way, the word man comes from the word mana. Man. It's called man in English, but man in, in American. But the word is basically manas, meaning the animal that has a mind is a man. Okay. Tra means to go beyond. Mantra, that which will take you beyond your mind so that you can live above the field of mind rather than under the field of mind. You see? Yeah. Now, when you, when you live above the field of mind, you can tell your mind what to do. When you are under the field of mind, then the mind is telling you what to do. It's almost like riding a horse, holding it from the bottom. <laughs> Life can be very rough, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it certainly can. Look at our, look at the world. And um, meeting a guru, meeting a guru is a technique in Indian tradition that will bring you on top of the horse rather than be holding on from the bottom. Bottom of the horse is suffering. Top of the horse is a play. There are two words in Sanskrit, Maya and Leela. Maya is when you are living a lifestyle that is leading to suffering. Like Buddha said, all life is suffering because most people live under the field of the mind. They are, they are riding under the horse. And Leela is when you get on top of the horse. Now life is a play. And when it's a play, you have two things. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. And when you win, or, or when, you, when you do win, you go and shake hands with the loser and say, today it was my day. Good, so mantra, purpose of mantra is to take you beyond the mind based, exactly. on, its, based on its definition. And when you go beyond the mind, um, what do you arrive at? You know then what the subject, who the subject is. Mm. Who are you? You go to that which is fundamental to the mind, you could say. No, no, the subject, you see. Right. Mind is an object. For example, I have a, a glass in my hand. I say my glass, right? Glass is an object. I am the subject. I also say my mind. I am the subject. Mind is an object. My body. I am the subject that lives in this body which is an object. Confusion is that you become the body, you become the mind. That's when the suffering begins. Live outside of your body, outside of your mind, outside of your ego. Then you can use them whenever you need to, whenever you want to, but you don't become them. It's like a role that you play. Like Shakespeare says, all life is a play. We all have our entrances and exits. As you like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the world's a stage. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say live outside your body, your mind, etc., I don't think you mean disassociated from it as if you were off five feet to the right or something. You, you mean somehow residing in a more fundamental level that is um, 
prior to the manifestation of mind and body. Would you say it that way? Exactly. Subject. Right. Try to remember what Socrates said. Know thyself. He didn't say know thy mind, thy soul, thy body, thy anything else. <laughs> right. Thyself. That means the people that he knew did not know themselves, including Plato, <laughs> who didn't even understand what his guru was telling him. Huh. So there's a section in your book, and there's a lot of talk in among spiritual teachers about um, the ego, you know, killing the ego or going beyond the sense of personal self. Um, there's a section in your book where you talk about, you know, that section of the of the Gita where it talks about, you know, the sense of doership or else recognizing that the gunas of nature are performing action. So, um, you know, when you go beyond the mind, when you when you know the self, um, does that in the same stroke uh, demolish the ego or kill it in some sense? Or does the ego become more of a just a faculty, but it's, it's a, but it's no longer recognized as who and what you are? No, it is one of your powers. Uh -huh. You use it when you want. Like your eyes or like your ears. Yeah, or any, it's, just, any, it's, it's a faculty. Anything that is an object. Mm -hmm. Subject should know how to use the object. If the object becomes the subject, you are living a secondhand life. And secondhand life will never bring contentment. Knowing the subject is part and parcel of spiritual life. So just to reiterate, um, I, I, you wouldn't say, would you, that the ego is at some point completely annihilated, but just that it takes its proper place in the whole structure of things. I can give you a, a practical example. Okay, good. When you go to sleep, or I go to sleep, or anyone does, we want to make sure that the body is rested and quite, uh, toes are tucked in and the shoulders are under the proper covers, right? So the ego of the body is now in a state of surrender. Then the feelings will take over. You will think about, you know, oh, maybe I said something to somebody I shouldn't have, you know. Uh, then you have surrendered now the ego of the feeling mind. Then thoughts will come to you what you have to do tomorrow, and slowly you will surrender the ego of your thoughts. And gradually, your third micro chakra, which is the ego principle, in the seventh. And the moment you renounce the ego of the seventh chakra mind, you have entered the sleep. The ego is a complete state of surrender when we are deeply asleep. In the daytime, we can do the same. Use whichever chakra mind's ego you need, and then go to the next, go to the next. In other words, you remain the subject. You hold on to the reins of your horse. Horse is the ego. You tell it where to go. You drive it. That's why Sri Krishna's role is so important in, in Mahabharata, that he is the driver of the prince Arjuna. <laughs> right, he's the charioteer. <clears throat> exactly. Mm. And all these uh, epics are basically the story of a human being. Yeah, allegorical. Yeah. Yeah. There's even a, a saying someplace or other that's a Brahman is the charioteer. I forget the Sanskrit. You may have heard it, but um, it's, um, I think it kind of fits in with <clears throat> what we're saying. Yeah. Um, do you advocate meditating before bed? I tell people to sit for a minute <clears throat> because between walking and laying down, there is an institution of sitting. You don't have your, you know, when you're walking, your heartbeat is much uh, faster. So before you lay down, it is better to give your heart a minute of rest. I think once I told that to my uh, cardiologist, that is this a good practice I teach people? He said that will give their heart a little bit more life. A transition, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, 
I've been meditating for a long time, about 51 years, and on average, a couple hours a day. And um, I have no problem with sitting and meditating for an hour. The whole thing is enjoyable. But I heard in one of your recordings, you were saying, uh, you know, that it's not advisable to meditate for longer periods because you go through these different cycles. One of them is seven minutes, and then another is something else. And you'll, you'll just be lost in daydreams. Um, but yeah, sure, the mind will pick up on thoughts and go off, but but it doesn't remain that way. And, and one can have a very deep meditation for a, a full hour or whatever. And of course, we've heard of yogis who will sit for days in samadhi. So I, I presume that this is not some kind of universal rule that you can't meditate more than a few minutes. No, no, I don't say that you cannot. You do what you want. <laughs> you, you live in a free world. Uh -huh. You can do what you want. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, if you don't have a lot of time. If you don't have a lot of time, uh, it's the quality of meditation that's more important than the than the quantity. Yeah. So what happens? I have I have some students who are monks from different traditions, and I can give you a live example of a monk who told me he used to meditate for two hours, an hour and a half in the morning, and half an hour in the evening. And I would ask him, do you have your bowel movement before you meditate? He says, not necessarily. I said, then don't close your eyes when you sit to meditate. He was shocked <laughs> that why his teacher didn't teach him that. Because years later when I met him, this man was glowing. And he says he only meditates now 24 minutes in the morning and one minute or two at night. And he, he was literally glowing because he will not close his eyes if he has not had a bowel movement. And then besides that, Rick, I want you to tell me, when we want to use a word, we should know what it truly means. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Sure. What, like okay. what kind of word? Any, any, word? any word. Okay, good. Any word. The word meditation has so many loose meanings. Everybody interprets meditation to what is their own meanings of meditation. Sure, it's like the word liquid. It could refer to orange juice, it could refer to ammonia, or any kind of thing. <laughs> that's, that's another example. Right. But the better example is to understand what does the word stand for? Now, let's see, what is the root of the word meditation? In Sanskrit, we call it dhyana. Dhyana. Okay, I will explain dhyana a little bit later. Let's go to the word meditation. It comes from Latin, and the word in Latin is meditare, which means to think. How many people do you think who are meditating know the meanings of the word meditation? I'm sure they've all been given some kind of definition, but uh, as you just said, the definitions I, must vary. I, I'm sorry, I'm just asking you a personal question. You were admitting to me that you meditate an hour or two every day? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, what, is, what does meditation word mean to you? To me, it means allowing the active mind to settle down and to become more and more and more and more refined and to the point where, you know, thought virtually ceases or ceases altogether and one just resides in the self or in pure awareness. Yeah. Um, and then there might be periods where the mind percolates up again and then resides back again during that during that yeah. period that's mm -hmm. the that's the description of the experience yeah you see what you are describing is the rate of breathing in relationship to the rate of thoughts yeah breathing settles are, down and, and of it, course they've done a lot of research on this stuff and the yes. whole physiology settles down along with it exactly yeah so when we live in a very stressful times it can become a therapeutic tool to calm the mind but that has nothing to do with meditation. That is a relaxation. Yeah, but remember the second verse in the Yoga Sutras, you know, yoga is chitta vritti naroda. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind, which is what I just described. <laughs> yes. Beyond the chitta, there is something else. Yeah, third verse. And then the seer rests in the self. Right, okay. What they are saying is that you think, what is the thought that you are planting in your mind when you are meditating? 
Meditare, remember that. Meditare means to think, not to cease thinking. I tell you something else. That's the English word, you, yeah. implication of it. In fact, it, meditation usually means contemplation. I think I'll go sit and meditate on the meaning of life or something like that. Yeah, you know? no, contemplation is a state, state prior to meditation. You know, you have, you know, yamas, niyamas, asanas, pranayama, pratyahara, you know, then, then yeah. dharma, dhyan, samadhi, right? Okay. First of all, without pratyahara, you can't even go there. Re define pratyahara for us. Pratyahara is the ability to invert your senses, discover, discover the inner aspect of the senses. Eyes know how to see outside. Eyes also can see what is inside. Some artists have a vision. They paint it. They inverted their visual sense. That's what made them an artist. There are people who compose a beautiful melody. They inverted their fifth chakra sense called hearing. They heard the melody and then they composed it. You see, this is all pratyahara. Without accomplishing pratyahara, you cannot go to dharana. Dharana is contemplation. Contemplation has to take place is with a singular thought in your mind that you want to sustain. A singular thought, whether it's a mantra, some people use breath to concentrate on. Once you accomplish dharana, then you go towards dhyana. And dhyana is a idea. You got to have an idea to think about. Meditation is to think about an idea and not be involved with your subtle body, your physical body, or your causal. Yes, it is a causal body phenomenon because causal body is where the thoughts are coming from. So you want to refine your causal body by realizing the true nature of the self, contemplating on the true nature of the self. But it's premature to think about that when you have not even been able to do what's called pratyahara. Therefore, I do not agree when people say, just because you can relax by sitting for an hour, you are not really uh, not making use of the time as wisely as you could. Okay. Well, especially in the 21st century. <laughs> just um, based upon my own experience, um, it radically transformed my life, just radically. Oh, of course it will. And More continues relaxed to. you are, yes. Progressively it will. Yeah. yeah. Also, when you say, um, uh, thinking about an idea just then, um, in the, I think it was the, the Dharana stage you were you're saying that? Uh, Dharana. What sort of idea are you referring to? Aham Brahmasmi. Uh, yeah, I am Brahman. Um, so, but, okay, so you're talking about a contemplative thing where one would contemplate on the notion aham brahmasmi or tatuamasi or one of those. Exactly. That, that, that's a singular thought. Yeah. When you are absorbed in that singular thought, that is meditation. But as I said, you cannot have enough practice behind it. And the practice part is pratyahara. Without the purification, by the way, you can't even go towards pratyahara. Many, many people are meditating. They don't even have a bowel movement. There are people who are practicing yoga, standing on their head without having a bowel movement. They don't understand the role of apana prana. Right. But presuming their bowels are all taken care of, <laughs> then, uh, then, you know, sitting in meditation. I mean, thinking... Wait a second. Wait a second. It's not complete. Okay. Having a bowel movement alone is not enough. After bowel movement, many people take a shower, many people don't. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. When you don't take a shower after bowel movement, your body is tamas. Right. Because toilet paper doesn't really wash, doesn't clean. Yeah. If I blow my nose in a tissue, 
and my nose is dry. And then you put a microscope on it, you will see a dance. You will see a dance of bacteria. Sure. Okay. Same way, the role of the toilet paper. You listen, we come from war-oriented societies. We do things fast, quick. We, we grab a hot dog and run. We grab a hamburger and run. We don't have the time to relate. We don't have the time to, I mean, to, to even clean. We just don't know how to clean. Most people, you know, they go into the shower, they turn the shower on, on their head. For millions of years, we went to the ponds or to the lakes, to the rivers, to the ocean, and we went with the feet first, not with the head first. So there are proper ways to purify your physical body. There are proper ways to purify your own sacred sexual energy. Second chakra mind has to experience its own sattvic nature. Only then can you deal with the mind of the ego, which is the third chakra mind. You know, you can use haphazardly this method, this method, that method, but that's like, uh, uh, I don't know, that doesn't really take you anywhere uh, in a way that if you had a proper guidance, a teacher that's monitoring your growth and taking you somewhere. Sure. I mean, the, the English word for that is dilettante, meaning yeah. a, su a superficial dabbler. You try this, you try that, you just keep <clears> jumping, <throat> jumping around and never buckle down and I do, do any one thing. I do not mean to imply that everybody is a dilettante, but I do mean to I mean that we don't know how to clean ourselves, how to purify, to purification of the thought, purification of the feeling. These are all thoughts. They will only be effective if we first know how to clean our bodies. We don't even know which direction to sleep. We don't even know which posture to sleep. I mean. <laughs> okay, so there's all, the, all these things and you place a lot of emphasis on that. And um, let's, let's, and you know, we could talk the rest of the whole interview about um, per, personal hygiene and, and all the, that kind of thing. Personal but, hygiene is personal. I want to make it public. Public hygiene, <laughs> but let's not use up all. Our, we have to sort of skim along a little bit in order to cover all, because there are many interesting things you have to say that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, well, if you just dropped one just there, which I think people will find interesting about sexual purity or purifying the second chakra. What what would you have to say about that? Just learn about the rhythm of your sexuality. Which day of the moon? is your sexual wave peaks. Feel that on your own, not, not because you are with somebody, then it will, it will react, it will not act, it will react. The first to understand your own sexual rhythm. Women are much better at it than men, but men can also, with practice, observe their own if you work with the prana calendar, which is freely available on our website, and you will see that which day of the week your nostril is wrong. Explain that, breath. explain that about the nostrils because people might not understand that. Okay. And yeah, how they alternate. Okay. Yeah. The way it works is this. After the full moon night, the following sunrise, Nature wants your right nostril to be more open so that the prana is directed towards the left hemisphere of the brain. Right nostril is called solar, pingala. And when the left, uh, when the left hemisphere of the brain is energized for the whole hour from sunrise to one hour, it's all mentioned in the prana calendar in the details when you read it. For three days, that will persist. That every morning, your meditation should end with the sunrise. And you check your breath. And if your right is open, congratulate yourself. Three days. After the three days, the left will take over. Every single sunrise for three days, 
your left will be dominant. You understand about dominant and recessive? Yeah. Um, at any at any given time, the, the breath we, predominantly we, comes out of one nostril or the other. Exactly. So after the full moon, it starts the cycle with the right. After the new moon, it starts the cycle with the left. And I presume and this they, has been tested and measured, and so. Oh my God! For thousands of years. Yeah. And even okay. the recent brain research has also verified it. Yeah, there's probably been some studies on it. Published. In nineteen, uh, when was that, uh, Professor? Patricia Carrington, she was my student, a, a professor of psychology in Princeton. I've heard of her. Yeah. She, in, yeah, she introduced this study in Princeton, and she, they found it to be true because she had uh, a few hundred students who were uh, experimenting with that. Mm -hmm. But they didn't accept it. Why? Because I don't know. Doesn't make sense to the Western physiology. <clears throat> exactly. Right. No, no. What they said was, the reason it is happening is because of the gravity. When you lay down on one side, it's the gravity that's causing it, which is also not true, because what is happening is <laughs> when you change the nostril by laying down, it drains your sinuses, so the other side opens up, which is a technique of how to correct your blocked nostril. When you do pranayama and you, and you alternate nostrils, does that somehow balance the... The, the two well, sides of the nervous system? No, that will just cleanse your uh, your pingula and ira so that you can breathe deeply for the rest of the day. I am talking about uh, the swar yoga. Swar yoga means the yoga of breath. And then you will, because it merges into the nadi yoga, which we will talk maybe, maybe later if you will have time. Uh, so, it is because the hemispheric relationship you want to establish to be under your control. For example, if you have a feeling, let's say anger comes to you, if you know Swar Yoga, you can control it a lot more easily than otherwise. Well, let me just interject a question that just came in from Michael in uh, Davao, the Philippines. He says, what is the best way to manage anger when it arises in the moment? <laughs> can, can you explain how anger and managing anger relates to the chakras? I thought it would be good to pop that question in since you just managed, mentioned it. Isn't that interesting that he was writing about anger and I was talking about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's some synchronicity there. Uh, anyhow, anger is something that arises when you see something was not justified from your perspective. Uh -huh. okay. So the first thing you want to know is that, is your justification a universal quality or your own individual? Because the other person's perspective may be totally opposite to yours. So the moment you start to put the other person's uh, perspective, your anger, is already not dominating at that time. In the meantime, you start to reflect. That is it a genuine reason to be angry? And most of the times, you will be able to find, find a resolve. Yeah, the that's a really way, good point, because there's a lot of anger these days in, in the United States and probably other places too. And there's also a lot of polarity between different points of view, you know, and, and both points of view hate each other and they're angry at each other all the time. And then there's all these violent outbursts. And exactly. what you're saying is pretty important. Yes. And the other thing is to drink two glasses of fresh water. In the morning? No, no, when you feel angry. Oh, when you feel angry. I see. Yeah. Two glasses. One what will not do it. What does that do for you? That will just calm you down. Oh, okay. Why? What's the mechanics of that calming you down? Because you see the water, water, you're 73% water, right? And when you drink water, it purifies the waters in your body. And the first glass of water will go to your brain. Second will be distributed in the rest of the body, some for the lymph node, some for the colon, so that you can have a easy uh, bowel movements and so on. So does this imply so, that, that uh, dehydration can uh, contribute to anger? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. So what you do is you, you see, the problem is that when you are angry, you don't think because you're so 
taken over by the anger. So you really have to practice that, that when I am angry, when I am emotional, when I am sad, when you are not sad, you have to remember those things. Once you become sad, it's difficult. So in other words, knowledge is very important before you make practice of it. You have to practice knowledge first. You know, that's called sadhana. That's spiritual work. Now, anger can also be subsided. You notice that when you are angry, your right nostril will be more open. Invariably. So what you do is you drink two glasses. You First of all, you lay down and change your nostril. The flow should be in the left nostril. Do you do that by blocking off the right one? No, no. You lay down on your side. I see. You put a pillow under your armpit and just rest for 30 seconds to a minute and sinuses will drain and the left nostril will become open. Now you drink two glasses of water. You watch what happens to anger. They should have little places all along the road where people who get road rage can just stop, lie down, get some water. <laughs> then they wouldn't well, go shooting people. <laughs> they can drink water anyway. Yeah. Even if they can't lay down. Yeah. You know, no, that's when good. you're angry, and if you have another driver in the car, let them drive and you go in the back seat and change your breath. Yeah. Huh. Well, it's good to remember. Um, Obviously, people get into all kinds of fights and arguments and commit all kinds of crimes and end up in jail for years, you know, because of anger, because of being caught up in some... some it's lack of... Yeah. Not anger. Not anger as much. It's lack of control over it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't get rid of anger. You can't get rid of ego. You just have to learn how to use it properly. Yeah. But don't you find, haven't you found in your own experience that... Um, you know, as you've grown, as as or in your students' experience, as they evolve, there's there's less of a ta tendency to fly into a rage about something. It's, it's sort of like you catch it before it even flares up. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. The more you know, older you get, wiser you get. The more you can control your emotions. Yeah. Like you were saying before about the horse, you know, riding the horse or being under the horse. It's like if you're under the horse, the horse can run away with you. Uh, but if you're riding the horse, then, you know, you, you can sort of keep the horse going where you want it to go before it even gets, you know, going <laughs> off in the wrong direction. That's right. <laughs> um, there's a question that came in from, uh, uh, this one is also from Florence, who asked an earlier question. She said, um, people... Uh, and I come, I come across this a lot, so it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say about it. People sometimes have very disturbing experiences with um, Kundalini awakening. In fact, next week I'm going to be interviewing a woman who um, wasn't even think, didn't know anything about Kundalini, and when she was about 52 or three years old, she had this profound Kundalini awakening and had to figure out what was going on. And she's very happy she had it now, but it was quite intense for a long time before she figured it out. Um, so what has been your experience in dealing with such people, um, whether or not their experience has been positive? Well, <clears throat> Kundalini, which is the proper way to pronounce it, Kundalini. Kundalini. No, Kundalini. Kundalini. K-U-N. Yeah. Kun. Yeah. Delini. That's the way I'm pronouncing e it. <laughs> yeah, like you say you are saying Kundalini. Oh, Don't, I'm saying, the, I'm, it, I'm putting the Italian uh, in it. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, it's, a, it's a mistake on the part of Indian scholars who spell it, who misspell it. Ah. For example, K-U-N-D-A-L, right? Yeah, Kunda. Yeah, but don't put the A there. Oh, okay. Kundalini. Oh, so the A is just very minimal. It's, it's not even there. Kundalini. When you write it in Sanskrit or Hindi, uh -huh. we don't write the A. Okay. Yeah, that's why in your book you have all these little tiny A's wherever they're... Exactly. Right. Yeah. Because most of the Indian alphabets, Sanskrit alphabets, mm -hmm. A is implied in them. I see. For yeah. example, instead of you say K, I say K. Mm -hmm. you, say, you say B, I say B. You say C... I say, sir, sir, so it's, uh, 
not ah. Okay. Right? So to, to her question then about, yeah. okay. The question is, Kundalini is a dormant energy that is in the base of the spine and it only awakens after the seven sister powers of hers are awake to make the pathway for the Kundalini to be able to rise in the proper channel, which is called the central channel. There was a Kundalini master who did not have a teacher and he tried to uh, awaken his own Kundalini and he did, except it rose in the wrong side. It went up in the right channel and it almost, uh, he almost died. Was that Gopi Never, Krishna? That is correct. Right, yeah, he had a hard I, time. Yes, he had a very hard time. I met him actually in Davos. He was making a presentation and so was I. And Dalai Lama was there as well. We were all making our own presentation of our work. So his problem was that he didn't accept the authority of a guru. So he wanted to do it with the books. And look what happened to him. Yeah. He had to eat a leg of lamb every day to keep grounded. Grounded, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyhow, back to the question of Kundalini. One of the sister powers, when she arises, you go through this dramatic feeling. It is not Kundalini, it's one of the sister powers. I can give you the names of them if you want. You know, Dakini, Rakini, Lakini, Sakini, Hakini, Yashwini. <laughs> okay, so if you, if you read the literature properly, ask this lady if she has ever read a book written by uh, Arthur Avalon. Oh, she has, I, I, I've been reading her book and she's mentioned him, yes. She has mentioned him. Yes. Okay. So she will then know that there are seven sister powers, I named them to you, and any one of them can awaken and can give you an extraordinary feeling. That is not Kundalini. In fact, I tell you one thing, I have been involved with this field now for since the age of 12, nearly 13, so about 70 years. And in my 70 years of experience, I have never ever seen a human being whose Kundalini was awake. Hmm. Even, now, your, even your guru? It must be, it wasn't. Your guru's wasn't. Okay. Uh, and presumably yours isn't, you're saying. So. I'm still I, working on the different goddesses. Okay. Uh, and so does that, does Kundalini awakening or full Kundalini awakening um, necessarily coincide with enlightenment? Or can you be enlightened and yet not have your Kundalini awake? No. Fully enlightenment takes place when the Kundalini awakens without any obstruction and rises in the central channel to go into the embrace with her counterpart, which is called Mahadeva, Shiva. And you've never encountered is, a person who has done that? No. no. Okay. Unfortunately. Maybe I have not met the right person. <laughs> and why do you suppose it's that, a, it's that I've rare? I've been a saint hunter. I've been a saint hunter since the age 13. Right. And so when people think they have had a Kundalini awakening, are you saying it's one of these seven sister powers that has exactly. a, okay. or their counterparts? Uh huh. Their counterparts are there too. It depends on the nature of the experience, whether it's a destructive one or is it a constructive one? Huh. Yeah. That's interesting because there have been spiritual teachers, so called, um, who seem kind of remarkable in certain ways. They they charismatic. They're maybe eloquent. Um, they may have seem to radiate shakti or something, and yet they're they've been very destructive in their behavior. And I've I've often wondered about that and thought, okay, well maybe they have a partial kundalini awakening and it's gotten misdirected and off in some side channel or something. But you're saying it might actually just be um, one of these sister powers. Just leave the kundalini alone. Just let's talk about her assistance first. Yeah. Huh. Did, and so did you just say that the assistants have to be awoken before the Kundalini itself can be awoken? They, they, they awaken. They awaken. With your spiritual work, if it's done properly, yeah. they will awaken. And then sometimes the gods awaken first, sometimes the goddesses awaken first. And then that's why the teacher comes into the picture who can either intuit that. And now you don't need to intuit that. You have microchakra psychology book in front of you. That will tell you 
What is your behavior like? What is the block? What is the opening? And you know, in terms of uh, having these uh, Shakti path and these uh, Siddhis and powers, they are distractions from your own spiritual growth. I, I have a Siddhi, I use that every day. Which is the inner tuning? To, to, to feel the micro chakra. Right, right. I, I have a CD. I can I can feel the difference between a blocked micro chakra and open micro chakra. Okay, it's a CD. Do, do I do I say that my Kundalini is awake? No, it's just one CD. Yeah, yeah. So would you say, as a general rule, that um, unlike Gopi Krishna, one shouldn't specifically do anything to try to awaken their Kundalini? It'll awaken on its own when the time is right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You do your sadhana. But one Krishna, Sri Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, karma neve adhikarasti. Karma is all we are entitled to. Mahaphalesha kadachina. The results are never to be contemplated upon. I like that verse. Yeah. Do <clears throat> your dharma. Do your karma. Let it happen. Out of ignorance, we start to use words that are uh, not even uh, used properly because we don't know the real meanings of the word. Kundalini Yoga, for example, it was it was a very clever yogi who uh, was not even a yogi actually. He was a custom inspector. I don't want to talk about personal lives of the people that I have known in my life. Yeah, I know the guy. Uh, he had a center yeah. down in New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, I'm not here to talk about people. <laughs> no, no. There are all kinds of people with all kinds of motives. Yeah. Including, my, including myself. Huh. What are your motives? My motives are to people to realize that they can take charge of their own spirituality. Hmm. Would you say, though, that, you know, there, these days, there are hundreds and hundreds of spiritual teachers of all different flavors and sorts and types. Um, do, you, do you feel like, by and large, or like, for instance, the 510 people I've interviewed, not, not all of them are teachers, but um, all kinds of people. Many of them are teachers. Do you, my, my attitude is nobody necessarily has the full picture, you know, but everybody's making a contribution. And, uh, you know, to use that, that, analogy from, um, I guess it's the Srimad Bhagavatam, we're all holding up our sticks and, you know, God is really holding up the mountain and we, we think we're helping holding up our sticks, but everyone's making a contribution and it just seems to be the, the way things are configured these days. There's this many to many kind of um, dynamic going on in the world right now. <laughs> you don't want to comment on that, do you? <laughs> I have no comment to make. Okay. Everybody has their own perspective. And it's the, because people have the need, and therefore the teachers appear. Yeah. And, you know, many people seem to, um, I know they're not dilettantes, but some people seem to derive a certain amount of benefit from a teacher for a certain amount of time. And people are definitely making progress. And then at a certain point, they feel like, well, this guy isn't doing it for me. I think he's taking me as far as he can take me. And then maybe they'll pick up with a new teacher. And, and it's like when you fly someplace, you usually have a, a few connecting flights and each connecting flight has its value. Uh, you know, you don't just, it's not just the flight from New York to Paris that's important. It's also the one from Harrisburg to uh, New York <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you with that. Yeah, Irene says just don't get on a flight that's gonna crash. Of course, you never know that in advance. Okay, so um, there's an interesting section in your book on a topic that I like a lot, which is um, you speak about subjective science and compare it with objective science. And obviously, you know, modern science is usually the, the objective science uh, that we learn in high school and so on. But the yogis have had a subjective science for um, thousands of years. And I've always been interested in the comparison between them and the contributions that each can make, because I don't think either one um, 
eliminates the value of the other. But I think together they can be more than the, the collection of the two of them. You are right. In the tradition of the objective science, there used to be a psychology called vitalism. Oh, yeah. Vitalism, uh -huh. which was eliminated for whatever political reasons. <clears throat> that might have led to the subjective psychology. But because it was eliminated, shall I say, many people don't even know about it. David, my co-author, he was an expert on vitalism. Um, so, but why so, don't you play? Why don't you play some sounds? Okay, then we can while get, I just uh, we can get back to this. Yeah, you let me know when to come in. I'll hear your voice. So we're we're going to play a selection from the CD that is in the back of your book, and yes. uh, and and you're accompanying. Your, we'll hear your voice, and it's accompanied by the tambura instrument, which we see behind your right shoulder there. That's right. That's the instrument I played with Ravi Shankar and many other great musicians and singers, especially. Yeah. So I'll play a little bit of this and then you just let us know when you're ready.
Welcome back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And we had that um, the music playing while you were gone, and people were listening to it. And someone sent in an email saying that it was beautiful. <clears throat> what what was that we were listening to? It's a mantra I chanted uh, for somebody who uh, had uh, severe depression, and it helped them a lot. So I thought. Uh, uh, why not uh, put it out so that people can buy it? For many years, people were uh, downloading it or buying it from our website. No, no, there was no download at that time. <laughs> so right now it's complimentary. They can download it uh, from the website. Yes, also it um, it's on a CD that's in the back of your book. Uh, that's the, yes, that's also one way to have it. And um, uh, Sri Radhe, Sri means sacred, means auspicious. Radhe is the mantra, which is uh, opens up your heart, so that your heart can then want to involve itself for the love of the divine in you. Nice. <laughs> in micro chakra terms, fourth micro chakra of the sixth will open up when you hear this mantra properly, and if you chant it for some time. Uh, it can really help you. And when the fourth of the sixth is open, the goal of your life becomes enlightenment. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> um, while the music is playing, a couple of people sent in um, an email saying that they would like to hear you uh, finish what you were beginning to explain about how to purify the second um, chakra energy or the sexual chakra energy. You began yes. talking about how people have different cycles according to the yes. time of month and all that, but then I think we got off on other topics and you didn't get to complete that that point. Right. You see, the goal of uh, sexuality is to find the right mate. And the right mate is not only just your finding your right mate, it is also who you will be able to parent together. So those are the considerations that the uh, third chakra age people who fall in love uh, between the ages of 12 and 18 for girls and 14 to 21 for boys, that's when people have the first experience, so to speak. <clears throat> and. Uh, when constructive experiences are guiding your intuitive mind, you can find the right mate. So the purification, again, is of the thought, causal body. Sexuality is an instrument. It's an object. You are the subject. Problem is that we have no university school or church or any place uh, at home where we can teach people to know the self. Who is the self? Because we live, you know, in we live in war-oriented times. We always have. There are not too many cultures that even had the concept of inverting the senses. Pratyahara. People, when they embraced the religion, it was to ask for forgiveness for the sins, to ask for the forgiveness so that unloving God will always love you. And then we do things totally the opposite. It's like, you know, you commit sin, then you go and you confess. Yeah. You commit a sin and you go and confess. It becomes a routine. It becomes a habit. And it doesn't work that way. You will rob yourself of your own bliss, of your own light, by believing in the old stories that may have been relevant to some people for some time, but their story is a story. I can't afford to give my life away for a story, no matter how old the story is. And we are addicted to stories. <coughs> Every baby. Every toddler, every small child wants to hear a story before they go to sleep. 
we are addicted to stories. And then we start to take some stories more seriously. <clears throat> well, just to add on to a follow-up question. Um, you have to discover your own purity of your own sexuality by refining your own thought process. That's why I mentioned the word meditare, that don't lose touch with, with your, don't gamble with your life. Think, we have a thinking mind. We have a causal body. And brilliant and brilliant ideas will come once you open up that. And in the age where we fall in love, sexuality gets not uh, enlightened, but it gets bonded bondage mm. binding so would it be fair to say as a sort of summary point that <clears throat> rather than being all worried about finding the right person you yes. should be more worried about being the right person you know exactly exactly <laughs> you put it very nicely yeah i yeah. like that yeah and if you refine yourself enough then everything else will, will you, you will attract fall you will into attract place the similar kind right that way you will attract the similar kind but if you keep on finding somebody that your ego loves, well, then that's what will happen. Yeah. Maybe another way of putting it is if you don't know who you are and they don't know who they are, then how can the two of you expect to have any kind of meaningful relationship? You know, two people who are just sort of stumbling about. <laughs> so my, my, my favorite way to put it is one lonely person meets another lonely person. Now you have two lonely people together. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I suppose even a third way of putting it is, you know, if if we're, you know, there's that beautiful saying in the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. If you're if you're full, then you can give. And if the other person is full, they can give. If both people are empty, then not, neither can give. Both are in sort of taking mode and nobody gives, therefore nobody gets. I remember my grandfather once said, he says, when the pots, you know pots? Sure. Pots like and pans? Pots and pans, yeah. Yeah. He said, when the pots travel together, they rattle. Uh -huh. But the fuller they are, the less noise they make. Good. Another good one. <laughs> okay. So I hope we've answered that question. Um, if there's any follow-up question on that, um, the, the person and the people who send it in, feel free to send in a follow-up question. We'll deal with it. Um, but here's or another. They can also, if there's a later afterthought, they can write to admin at chakrainstitute.com. Okay. And, I mean, after the show is over, if there is a question, they can write to us directly. Yeah. If you want, I'll even put that email address on your page on batgap.com, and they, they know how to get in touch then. That would be great. Okay, good. Um, this is an interesting question that came in from a fellow named Bernard Blumenthal in Brussels, Belgium. Um, he said, um, my identical twin brother and I uh, live on opposite sides of the ocean. He's in Chicago. I'm in Brussels. We're both 60 years old and struggling with a slow and steady disintegration of our professional lives while being hyper aware of both the general political strife on the planet and also predominantly the dire, nearly impossible future of our living planet. <laughs> He's referring there to climate change and environmental collapse. Um, would a particular practice help us to become more pure, more relaxed, sane, effective, and positive? Or is the planet's situation simply a psychological burden to bear until our civilization collapses and mass extinction gains us all? What a remarkable question. Yeah. I congratulate you for your concerns. I really do. I have two answers. One is at the individual level, and one will be at the universal level. At the universal level, choose the candidates that are concerned with your concerns. Individual level, get yourself a three-body purification. At the individual level, when your own three bodies go through a period of purification, it takes from five to nine days, depending on where you... I, I do it around the world. Ex so explain the whole thing, in, because this is the first time you've referred to that. So just tell us what that means, the whole yeah. three-body three purification. Okay. Three-body purification means purifications of your thought process, purification of your feeling process, 
and purification of the physical body's organs, colon, liver, kidneys. You know, it took me 40 years to develop this. <laughs> and once I developed it, I tell you, people just, just they flock. They flock together to come and they can't hardly wait to have another one. And this is an so, in-residence program that you in -residence offer, program. offer yes. here and there. Okay. This place where I am right now, and New Hope, Pennsylvania, we got this place to do purifications. It's, it's very quiet, 10, 11 acres of woods, and uh, we have only six bedrooms, so we don't take more than 12 people. Uh, maximum 15 sometimes, if people like to sleep in the laundry room. <laughs> sometimes people do that because they, they have to have it. Uh, and then we do one every year in Holland, which is not very far from Brussels. It's True. Yeah, it's yeah. short train in, ride. In fact, I will be doing a workshop in Brussels as well. They can find my itinerary on the chakrainstitute.com. They will know. Okay. So this purification I do in South America as well, in Colombia, for example. Every January, we do that over there. Nine days again. Nine days in Holland. Five days in France five days, several times here in our Chakra Institute where I am uh, being interviewed with you. So, because most people get most benefit from these purifications, and after that, I do more advanced workshops where we can teach them <clears throat> how to do massage to themselves. It's called inner tuning massage. Everybody who will come to see me privately, they get one 15 minute, 20 minute, massage themselves. And then my assistant does that, Marina Toliva. She's one of the people that I have trained in this. Uh, I have about maybe two dozen people around the world that are doing the inner tuning massage. Some of them are in Belgium, some of them are in Holland. You will find all that information on the website. Okay, good. Now, the best part of his, his answer to his question is, when you choose the right candidates, they will make the planet become livable. It may even extend the life of the planet. And there are some advanced techniques that you can do, but I can only teach them after the purifications. And on the air, it is not fair. Not feasible, yeah. Yeah. But I think what you're saying, to summarize what you just said, is that you know, yes, the world is a mess and things need to be done on the political level and the technological level and so on to, to deal with what a mess the, the climate is and, and so on. And right, right leaders is important. But also, you know, we I, have... Go ahead. I'm sorry to interject. No, no problem. I know many people who don't vote, saying that it's hopeless, we don't want to be bothered, which I think is really unfair to live on a planet and not exercise your vote, the value of your vote cannot be overemphasized. Well, I'm listening to a show right now on TV. I haven't finished it, but they said that the United States is about 132nd in the world in terms of voter turnout, voter participation. So that's crazy. I mean, it's it makes such a huge difference to have the right people as our leaders and people just don't. Of course, they, a certain political party here makes it difficult to vote by, you know, making it as complicated as possible, <laughs> suppressing yeah. it if possible. But you have to even if they vote, it's not counted. Yeah, very often. Yeah, there's things. I saw a black priest actually interviewed on some television show. He said there are seven boxes of votes. Nobody came to collect them. Yeah, that kind of thing happens. There's a suit going on in North Carolina right now where, anyway, we better not get off on that tangent. No, um, <laughs> that's not my interest at all. Yeah. Um, but to Bernard's point uh, and to your point, I think that you know, there's two elements. There's what needs to happen, like you said, on a universal level, on a national level, and so on. But also, we have to become individually as fit as possible to withstand the challenges that undoubtedly we're already facing in life and that are, could actually become much more dire, much more intense um, uh, in the coming years. So, um, you know, I, who was it supposedly... Um, uh, Darwin supposedly said survival of the fittest is the law of nature. So we have to be fittest, as fit as possible. Um, 
you know, I mean, let's say a donkey has to carry a really heavy load, this, and, and he can barely struggle with it. There's two ways of doing of dealing with it: lighten the load or strengthen the donkey. Yeah. And <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think the load is going to get any lighter in terms no. of what the world is going through. So we all have to be as strong and fit as possible, right? Well said. Yeah. Okay, so um, we've covered a lot of points, but undoubtedly we haven't covered. Well, there's one more point I thought of, um, you know, on the whole sexual topic again. I mean, you use the word Tantra, and in many people's minds, Tantra is synonymous with good sex or something, or, you know, using spiritual practices to make sex more long-lasting or more interesting or, or something. But then I hear more traditional tantrics say, well, that is you know, just a misrepresentation of it. It's just such a tiny aspect of it. And the, it's unfortunate that the whole thing has become synonymous with, with that. So, um, you know, do you have any comments on the misuse of, of the word Tantra and the whole sexual connotation of it? As usual, I go to the origin of the word. <laughs> Tantra means a tool. But literally de defined means a tool? Yes. Okay. It's a tantra. Yeah. Tantra is actually, it's a tool to achieve a goal. And there are two servants of the tantra. One is called yantra. One is called mantra. Yantra is the form and mantra is the name. When the form and the name are complementary and the practice is purely intentional, the tantra will be accomplished. And every tantra gives you a siddhi, a power. Eventually, we must develop the power in order to be able to make use of it in a state of surrender. Same thing is about the sexual tantra. We must develop the technique and then we surrender it. Who do you surrender it? With your partner. But you first must understand how to develop a form and give a name to it, which is a mantra. So uh, what does it mean to develop it with your partner and then surrender it? What are you actually saying there? Sexual intercourse is not the only thing that a tantra uh, teaches. That's only one part of it. Tantra should be how to make the marriage a success. Right, okay. So sex is used as a glue to keep the bondage. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. And tantra obviously has much more to do much more that is much more even than marriage i mean it's a whole huge body of knowledge right that has implications for even unmarried people there, there are thousands of tantras thousands one of the tantras is sexual because it's based on the second chakra karma yoga is a third chakra tantra so there's different it's tantras for all the chakras oh yes oh yes because uh People are kind of obsessed with sexuality, so they interpret the word Tantra only in a sexual way. Sure. Well, you know, relationships are an important thing for people, and, and, very, and very often they don't work out very well, and they cause a lot of heartache and trauma. And so people want to be able to learn how to do it right, you know, and, and have uh, good relationships. And so exactly. that's why they're interested in this stuff. Yeah. See, the best way to purify your own sexuality is to pay attention to your partner's need. And if you will pay attention to her need and she pays attention to your need, Tantra is accomplished. But most people, you see, they go for their personal needs and that's what creates a little problem. Yeah, like we were saying before about taking rather than giving. Yes, mm. yes. Okay, well, I hope that answers her question, the, the woman from Switzerland. And um, so we, we've been talking for a little over two hours. Um, and uh, is there anything you feel that's important that you haven't had a chance to say? 
I'm sure there are lots of things, but you know, what, what, what is it that you would really want to make sure to leave people with? Um, the gem of the teachings to go to bed early. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. As the, you know that old saying, of course, don't you? Early to bed and early to rise makes the traveler healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's true. Yeah. Good. How, how, how early is early? Well, it depends on the winter and summer, you know. In the summer, for example, the sun sets very late. So just after the sun goes down within half an hour, to go to sleep. Wow, yeah. And in the, in the winter, measure how many hours of sleep you need. If you need eight hours of sleep, you want to wake up at six o'clock because the sun rises uh, about seven or something in the winter. See, everything has to do with the sun. Just find out where you are located in relationship to the sun. Closer you are to the equator, the more easy it is for you to wake up early. It's only when you are farther away, you need more sleep because you are not at home. Equator is your home. That's where the life began, at least the human form. Yeah, I have this friend uh, here in town and I, I discovered this thing where you can um, be notified by email when the International Space Station goes over. And you know, several nights I've gone out and watched it. So it's really fun to watch it go over. So I, I told my friend, hey, tonight it's going over at 10.02. And, and he said, I'm sorry, I go to bed at quarter of nine. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, this man is a good candidate for spiritual work. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a spiritual guy. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope everyone else has. Um, I will be putting up a uh, page on batgap.com with your photo and your bio and your link to your website, and I'll put that, uh, that email address you said, admin at chakrainstitute.com, and uh, your book, link to your book, and anything else you want me to put. Um, and so people can get in touch with you and find out, as you were saying, all the, the programs that you have to offer and when and where you're going to offer them. Well, at 84, I'm still traveling three times a week, eh, three a times a year, a year. around yeah. the world. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an inspiration. Because I, I really have a, uh, this is my passion to help people know themselves. Yeah. No, it's great. And it's a good example of, of what, I mean, you, you are a good example of what you teach, you know. You see, the thing is this. If we are made up of light, hmm, supernova explodes. Stardust makes planets. Stardust makes this body. It does. So we are particle of the stardust. And inside this cage, there is a light. And when you... When you meditate, you see that light. Idea is to increase that light day by day, day by day, day by day. And a time comes, it will reach your heart chakra and your skin will start to radiate that light. Your eyes will have that twinkle of a baby because you are discovering your own inner light. And it's only possible in the human birth. Whether or not there is another birth, I don't know. But I know one thing. This life is under my control. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so to those who've been listening or watching, uh, this is an uh, ongoing series, as most of you know. And there's a few little things you might want to check out. If you'd like to be notified when new interviews are posted, subscribe to the YouTube channel and also and or uh, subscribe to the email notification thing, which you can find a link for on batgap.com. Um, this exists as an audio podcast as well as a video. So if you'd like to subscribe to that, there's also a page on batgap.com where you can subscribe to it. And a number of other things, if you just check the menus on, on that site, you'll see what we have to offer there. So thank you so much, Shyamji. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and 
good luck. I hope you are able to do this for many more years to come. <laughs> God willing. And thanks to those who have been listening or watching, and we will see you for the next one.